Hello, my name is Cecilia Hartzell and I am here to talk to you about Frederick Douglass's life-changing visit to Ireland in 1845. I'd like to quickly thank the Fingal uh, Festival of History for inviting me to, to give this talk. Delighted to do it and uh, glad to see that you've logged in to listen. Thank you very much. I use the words, I live a new life in the title of this talk because those are the words Douglas used to describe his time here. He did live a new life here, which shaped and expanded his worldview and in turn influenced his life's work as an abolitionist and as an advocate for human rights. Today, I'd like to talk a bit about Douglas's background so that you understand who he was by the time he came to Ireland. Uh, his trip here, a bit about that trip's influence on his work and his perspective as well once he returned to the US. And in preparation for my talk, in addition to my own research of Douglas's writings and archival reports of his visit to Ireland, I researched the work of Douglas scholars, including William McFeely, David Blight, Tom Chaffin, Lawrence Fenton, and Christine Keneally, as well as historians Eric Foner and David Olusoga. All of their work underpins the information that I'll share with you today. And just a note on the document booklets that were sent to you. Because it's difficult to give you a real sense of Douglas's visit here in 40 minutes, I thought it would be useful for you to have some documents from the period. So there are some write-ups from the Freeman's Journal on Douglas's talks in Dublin, advertisements for one of his talks and for the narrative on what was then the Cork Examiner, a write-up from the Belfast newsletter, and copies of American documents that I'll reference in the talk. I always find that documents make history come alive and so I hope they'll do the same with, for you with reference to Douglas. In the early struggle for African-American equality and civic inclusion in the United States, before the epic names that many of you might be familiar with, T. Thomas Fortune, W.E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, before all of those people, Frederick Douglass blazed that trail. He is a towering figure in American history. Frederick Douglass was born Frederick Bailey, born into slavery in Maryland in or around 1818 to Harriet Bailey, who was a slave. All Douglass knew of his father was that he was white. He never was sure of his exact birth date nor who his father was. And unfortunately, that uncertainty concerning parentage and exact date of birth were characteristic of the slave experience. After he was separated from his mother as an infant, Douglas lived for a time with his maternal grandmother, seeing his mother only four or five times before her death when he was seven years old. He was taken from his grandmother when he was six to live and work on the Y plantation in Maryland. 20 years after escaping slavery, Douglas wrote a letter to Hugh Wald, his former master. That letter is referenced by historians as, I love you, but I hate slavery, from a line in the letter. He wrote it hoping to find out more about his childhood and his background. And again, that letter highlights the issues of loss of identity and sense of place that were hallmarks of the slave experience. I've included a copy of that letter in your booklets. From the Y plantation, Douglas was given to Lucretia Ald, whose husband, Thomas, sent him to work with his brother, Hugh, in Baltimore. And at some point, Hewald then took legal ownership of Douglas. It was against the law to teach a slave to read, but Douglas was taught the alphabet by Hugh's wife, Sophia, who also read the Bible to him. But once Hugh Ald discovered that, he forbade his wife to continue teaching Douglas. From there, Douglas taught himself to read and write. He would later write that from that moment, he understood that knowledge was the pathway from slavery to freedom. He was hired out by Ald to work on the docks in Baltimore and was able to earn a few pennies of his own by polishing boots. He had one book, a cast off copy of Noah Webster's Speller, and he used that to learn to read. He used the money earned polishing boots to buy the popular school book, The Columbian Orator. Not only did that book teach him the rules of elocution, but the examples of oration in the book from Socrates, Milton, William Pitt, Benjamin Franklin and George Washington, among many others, exposed Douglas to ideas and to American and English poets, statesmen and clergymen. This book 
helped Douglas become a believer in the power of ideas and in the power of language in effectively communicating those ideas. It was critical in helping to shape the perspective and presentation of the Frederick Douglass who would visit Ireland. By the time he was hired out by Ald to work under William Freeland, Douglass was teaching other slaves to read using the Bible. Word got back to Thomas Ald, who sent Douglass, who was 15 at the time, to Edward Covey. He was a farmer who was known for his brutal treatment of slaves, and he was notorious for breaking their spirits. Douglas was regularly whipped by Covey, but after numerous whippings, he had a violent confrontation with Covey and he was never whipped by him again. Douglas recalled that this confrontation was the turning point in his life as a slave, rekindling his desire for freedom. After several failed attempts, Douglas finally escaped from Covey's farm in 1838 when he was 20 years old, making it to New York by acquiring papers from a black sailor he had met on the docks in Baltimore and then running away from Covey's farm and using those papers to board a train to Delaware, then using a system, a system of safe houses owned by abolitionists to make his way to New York. Once he was settled in New York, Bailey sent for Ann, Anna Murray. She was a free black woman from Baltimore who he had met when he was in captivity with the Alts. Murray fa facilitated his escape by providing money for a train ticket as well as a sailor's disguise. She joined him and the two were married in September, 1838. They were married for 44 years and until her death in 1882, and they had five children together. After their marriage, the Baileys moved to New Bedford, Massachusetts, where they met uh, Nathan and Mary Johnson, who were colored, uh, a free, per free persons of color, and they were a married couple. At first, the Baileys adopted Johnson as their married name because it would have been too dangerous to continue using Bailey but it was actually Nathan Johnson who inspired the couple to take the surname Douglas after the character in the Sir Walter Scott poem, The Lady of the Lake. In New Bedford, Douglas began attending abolitionist meetings. During those meetings, he was exposed to the writings of abolitionist and journalist William Lloyd Garrison. Garrison was a radical abolitionist from Boston. He was the founder of the American Anti-Slavery Society, as well as the publisher of the influential anti-slavery newspaper, The Liberator. Garrison and Douglas met when both were asked to speak at an abolitionist meeting, during which Douglas shared his story of slavery and escape. It was Garrison who encouraged Douglas to become a speaker and leader in the abolitionist movement. And Garrison is really important in understanding Douglas's story as he and Douglas developed a close friendship and Douglas's correspondence with Garrison throughout his trip here has contributed to historians' understanding of the ways that trip, that trip shaped uh, Douglas's perspective. By 1843, Douglas had become part of the American Anti-Slavery Society's lecture circuit. He was physically assaulted several times by those opposed to the abolitionist movement. But this fight against slavery by the abolitionists was not only words, it was persuasion and deeds as well, petitioning, founding anti-slavery newspapers such as Garrison's The Liberator, political action, and harboring fugitive slaves. But the spread of knowledge about the realities of slavery was also a vital component of the movement. Garrison understood that and he encouraged Douglas to write the story of his enslavement and escape from slavery. Douglas himself felt that he had to write it because of the insinu insinuations and outright statements from audience audiences at his lectures that he had not been a slave. Douglas wrote, people doubted if I had ever been a slave. They said I did not talk like a slave, look like a slave, nor act like a slave. They said he didn't tell us where he came from, what his master's name was, and how he got away, which of course he couldn't. Besides, he is educated and is in this a contradiction of all the facts we have concerning the ignorance of slaves. I resolved to dispel all doubt by such a revelation of facts as could not be made up by any other or made by any other than a genuine fugitive. So two years later, seven years after his escape, Douglas published the first and most famous of his three autobiographies, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. The book was published by the Anti-Slavery Office in Boston in June 1845, priced at 50 cents. 
By the autumn, 4,500 copies had been sold in the U.S. There went on to be three European editions, the first one printed here in Ireland, and within five years, 30,000 copies had been sold. The slave trade had been outlawed in Great Britain in 1807, with the institution itself abolished in the British Empire in 1833. However, the British anti-slavery movement remained intact and its target became slavery in the United States. As David Olusoga points out, the abolitionist's central message was that slavery was a moral issue, not a political one. And as such, slavery was an affront to moral people everywhere. And there were strong ties between the anti-slavery groups in the US and in Great Britain and both recognized the value of making it possible for the public to see and hear a victim of the institution of slavery. And because of the success of his narrative, the most ardent abolitionist in Britain wanted to hear Frederick Douglass tell his story in person. Also because of the notoriety associated with the publication of the narrative, there was a real danger that Douglass could be recaptured by slave catchers and returned to the odds. So with all those factors considered, it was an opportune time for Douglass to go abroad. He left for Britain on the 16th of August, 1845, at 27 years of age. In Douglas's words, the object of my labors in Great Britain was the concentration of the moral and religious sentiment of its people against American slavery. The themes of his talks in Ireland were his core anti-slavery message, corollary talks that targeted American churches links to slavery, and he also spoke out in support of temperance. I'll discuss his sojourns in Dublin, Cork, and Belfast, but he also visited Limerick, Wexford, and Waterford during the five months he was here from August 1845 to January 1846. Abolitionists supported several reform movements in addition to the abolition of slavery, including pacifism, the extension of women's rights, and temperance. Frederick Douglass spoke at several temperance rallies in Dublin, including rallies in Selbridge, in Booterstown, both hosted by Father Theobald Massey. It seems that the opportunity to speak on an issue other than slavery, that his opinion would have been uh, valued as much as those of white speakers, meant a great deal to Douglas. In a letter to Garrison, he wrote, regarding the overwhelming number of invitations he had received to speak at temperance rallies, Douglas wrote, I have invitation after invitation to address temperance meetings, which I am compelled to decline. How different from my treatment at home. In this country, I am welcomed to the temperance platform side by side with white speakers and am received as kindly and warmly as though my skin were white. That letter to Garrison brings up an interesting point about American abolitionists. As historian Eric Foner maintains, while abolitionist, abolition was the first racially integrated social movement in America, and the first one to make equal rights for African Americans a central component of its political agenda, it was also very much a product of its time and place in terms of racism. Because of that, there was an aspect of racist behavior in the abolitionist movement in America in that white males were in the decision-making in the decision-making positions. Even Douglas wrote that after a year or two on the anti-slavery society uh, lecture circuit, he had been reading more and he wanted to add more about um, the philosophy of American freedom to his speeches, but he was told, you just tell your story, we'll take care of the philosophy. But as Foner also says, what, what is amazing about American abolitionists is not that they were products of their time, but the extent to which they were able to rise above it, refusing to compromise on the principle that a slave was a moral being and could not be owned. So American abolition was very much a two-sided coin. And I tell you that to give you some perspective on Douglas's experiences with Irish abolitionists. Douglas intended to stay in Dublin for four days, but stayed for nearly six weeks. I can relate to that as I was often known to extend my visits when I visited Dublin from America. It's that kind of place. Douglas delivered seven anti-slavery speeches in Dublin, two at the Quaker Meeting House, two at the Royal Exchange, which is now City Hall, and three at the Music Hall on Abbey Street. In Dublin, he stayed with the family of Richard D. Webb. Webb was a Quaker and a printer by trade. He was active in abolitionist circles, and he had actually met Garrison in London 
at the World Anti-Slavery Convention in 1840. They became friends and Webb went on to host Garrison and several other American uh, abolitionists as they came through Dublin on the lecture circuit. Webb was aware of who Douglas was and of the publication of his narrative. So he became interested in publishing an edition of his narrative on this side of the Atlantic and to hosting Douglas and arranging a lecture uh, tour for him here in Ireland. But the publication of his narrative here in Ireland was transformative for Douglas. When you take a look at the narrative, you'll see that it contains a preface from William Lloyd Garrison and a letter from Wendell Phillips, both prominent abolitionists. Historian William McFeely explains that this was a convention for the publication of slave narratives. Introductions or prefaces by respected white male abolitionists served to vouch for the author as well as the authenticity of the narrative. Webb had printed an initial 2,000 copies of the narrative, which sold out. This is my biggest fan here, my Kit Kat, I'll just move him. <laughs> However, in working with Webb and planning the next printing run, Douglas decided to write his own preface to his narrative, which would precede the Garrison and Phillips documents in the publication. He was taking ownership of his story with the recognition that he had every right to compose his own preface, to explain in his own words why he felt compelled to publish his own story. And I think that was a life-changing decision for him and I think it was also influential in his decision to launch his own newspaper once he returned to the States. I'll talk a little bit about that later, but I'll just stop and uh, quickly say here that when I gave this talk for the first time in Dublin, a very nice gentleman from the audience uh, showed me a copy of that edition with uh, Douglas's preface ahead of the other two, uh, the other two bits, the other Garrison and um, Phillips documents in the, in the narrative. It's really amazing to see. The hallmark of Douglas's stay in Dublin was his opportunity to meet Daniel O'Connell. Douglas said that he had come to know of O'Connell's name through hearing it cursed by his masters because of O'Connell's campaign against slavery. And he said he had first come to love O'Connell because of that, but he grew to respect O'Connell's other principles as well. He heard that O'Connell was speaking at Conciliation Hall down on Burke Key and went down to try to hear him speak. It was a huge crowd, but he was ultimately um, managed to get into the hall and was introduced to him by O'Connell's brother, John. Decades after his trip to Dublin, Douglas wrote about meeting Daniel O'Connell and hearing him speak that day. And I think hearing his words about that meeting and his observations of O'Connell will demonstrate Douglas's admiration for him much better than I could. Until I heard this man, I had thought that the story of his oratory and power were greatly exaggerated. His eloquence came down upon the vast assembly like a summer thunder shower upon a dusty road. I never heard it surpassed if equaled at home or abroad. In Dublin, we, he had been absent from that city a few weeks. I saw him followed through Sackville Street by a multitude of little boys and girls shouting in loving accents, there goes Dan, there goes Dan. He was called the liberator and not without cause, for though he failed to effect the repeal of the union between England and Ireland, he fought out the battle of Catholic emancipation and was clearly the friend of liberty the world over. In introducing me to an immense audience in Con Conciliation Hall, he playfully called me the Black O'Connell of the United States. No transatlantic statesman bore a testimony more marked and telling against the crime and curse of slavery than did Daniel O'Connell. He would shake the hand of no slaveholder nor allow himself to be introduced to one if he knew him to be such. When the friends of repeal in the southern states sent him money with which to carry on his work, he with an effable scorn refused the bribe sent and sent back what he considered the blood-stained offering saying he would never purchase the freedom of Ireland with the price of slaves. O'Connell and Douglas never corresponded and O'Connell would pass away just two years later but his influence on Douglas is visible in the numerous references uh, he made to O'Connell in his writing and in his speeches. Another life-changing influence on Douglas was the poverty he witnessed in Ireland. 
When Douglas arrived in, here in 1845, the famine was just starting to take hold, but there was already widespread poverty here. In a letter he wrote to Garrison, Douglas described what he saw and its effect on him. I spent nearly six weeks in Dublin, and the scenes I there witnessed were such as to make me blush and hang my head to think myself a man. I speak truly when I say I dreaded to go out of the house. The streets were almost literally alive with beggars. I have had more than a dozen around me at one time, men, women, and children, all telling a tale of woe which would make any but would move any but a heart of iron. He also visited what he described as the mud huts of the poor. In that same letter to Garrison, he wrote, I see much here to remind me of my former condition, and I confess I should be ashamed to lift up my voice against American slavery, but that I know the cause of humanity is one the world over. He who really and truly feels for the American slave cannot steal his heart to the woes of others. I think witnessing that level of poverty here opened Douglas's eyes to the fact that the scope of human misery extended beyond the boundaries of the institution of slavery in America and that altered view in combination with his exposure to O'Connell's worldview shaped his political perspective going forward. There was not much he could do at that point, but Christine Keneally informed me that Douglas did send back a donation to help the poor here. In Cork, Douglas stayed with the family of Thomas Jennings. Jennings was a soda water and vinegar manufacturer, a temperance advocate, uh, advocate a Protestant, a Unitarian, and a leader of the Cork Anti-Slavery Society. He and his wife, Jane, had eight children. Jane and one of her daughters, Isabel, served as co-secretaries of the Cork Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. Douglas seemed to have made a connection with the Jennings family. Jane Jennings wrote, we are a large family, generally not considered easily pleased, but Frederick won the affection of every one of us. Every day um, only increased our affection and respect for him. Douglas spoke at least four times on temperance in Cork, and although he was not a drinker, he took the temperance pledge from Father Matthew. Douglas wrote to Garrison that he was hailed as a temperance man in Cork, as well as an abolitionist. That was probably due in part to the efforts of Father Matthew. He was invited by Father Matthew to speak at the Cork Temperance Institute on the 21st of October. There, in addition to speaking in favor of temperance, he used alcohol as a metaphor, transforming his talk into an anti-slavery speech saying, I am deeply engaged in the anti-slavery cause. I am deeply engaged in attempting to get my colored brethren out of slavery. I believe that if we could but make the world sober, we would have no slavery. Mankind has been drunk. I believe that if the slaveholder would be sober for a moment, would consider the sinfulness of his position, hard-hearted as he is, I believe there is humanity enough if we could get him sober, we could get a public opinion sufficiently strong to break the relation of master and slave. All great reforms go together. On the 14th of October, Douglas spoke at Lloyd's Hotel and as he did in most of his anti-slavery speeches, described the painful realities of his bondage. I was a thing of household property to be bought and sold or used according to the will of my master. I was subject to all the evils and horrors of slavery, to the lash, the chain, the thumbscrew, and even as I stand here before you, I bear on my back the marks of the lash. He also often brought leg and neck irons with him to these talks, hoping that these implements of the institution of slavery would convey its inhumanity to Irish audiences, and they did. Although there had been one or two free men of color, men who had been born free, who had visited Ireland on the anti-slavery circuit, generally Irish people would not have seen many African Americans and certainly would not have come into contact with many, if any, former slaves. As David Olusoga says, Douglas was intelligent, he was an eloquent speaker, and he was well-dressed. And all of those things brought home the fact to the audiences that at the end of the day, he was very much like them. There was a commonality between them. And once that kind of recognition occurs, that's how hearts and minds are changed. Even if the audience members did not support slavery, 
it was the 19th century, there were still entrenched stereotypes regarding the characteristics of black people or of slaves and Douglas dispelled all of those. At the Wesleyan Chapel on the 17th of October, with Cork's mayor, Richard Dawson present, Douglas spoke out against organized religion, which he felt had failed him when he was enslaved. He upbraided the Methodists for backsliding from their staunch 18th century condemnation of slavery, and then went on denomination by denomination, damning the churches for condoning slavery. He went on to do the same in Belfast, where he stayed for several weeks, and his lectures, despite his continued condemnation of churches, were very popular. Curiously enough, in Belfast, charges were circulated that he was an imposter. Douglas was well used to those insinuations, though, and in a lecture in Belfast on the 23rd of December, he said, I am not an imposter. If those who insinuate that I am, uh, that I am one can prove it, I should be as ready as anyone to give way. I have been in Ireland for four months and have delivered upwards of 50 lectures in different parts of the country. I have no fears of being examined. In his writings, I did find a moving passage about the purchase of a lot, which I was surprised to see he considered a personal milestone. He wrote that while he was a slave, he could hardly hope of someday owning a watch. Yet he did dream of owning, as he wrote, a real English bullseye, such as a, a sailor, a regular sea captain might have sported with heavy chain and seal for the watch bob of his, of his pants. If a man in those days had a watch, it was not allowed to remain a secret to the outside world, he wrote. It was a sign of wealth and respectability. In my manhood, no article in my ownership has been more serviceable to me. My successive life has depended upon punctuality. In 50 years, I do not remember missing a single appointment. So he kept that watch for the rest of his life. And I just found that story so moving. For him, that simple watch was a testament to how far he had come in life. And for me, it reminded me of the, of the humanity of someone who I think of as legendary and consider larger than life. So why were those months in Ireland so transformative for Frederick Douglass? The influence of O'Connell's worldview, the realization that the scope of human misery was broader than he had imagined, the level of independence he achieved here, the respect he was shown, as well as the power his words carried in Ireland. And lastly, his experience with publishing the narrative and writing his own preface to it, all led him to, as Christine Keneally says, find his voice here in Ireland finding his voice in Ireland then I would argue shaped his life and his work when he returned home to the United States in 1847. Nervous about the possibility of being caught by slave catchers and re-enslaved upon his return to the U.S. but financially unable to bring his family to join him in England, Douglas was grateful for the efforts of Ellen and Anna Richardson, Quaker supporters in England, who purchased his freedom. Many staunch anti-slavery advocates were against that purchase of his freedom because they thought that tacitly acknowledged the right of one man to own another. Douglas dealt with this issue in one of his autobiographies, saying that were he not a public figure, he might have agreed with them, but he felt he could be of more use to his people as a free man. Plus, he, he was like any other husband and father. He missed his family. He'd been away from the States for two years. Douglas attended the Women's Rights Convention held at Seneca Falls, New York in July, 1848, one of few men to do so. And he was only uh, one of only 32 men, along with the 68 women who signed the Declaration of Sentiments. Based on the American Declaration of Independence, the sentiments demanded equality with men before the law, in education, and in employment. In his speech to the convention, and this will, these words will sound familiar to you, Douglas said, all good causes are mutually helpful. The benefits accruing from this movement for the equal rights of women are not confined or limited to women only. They will be shared by every effort to promote the progress and welfare of mankind everywhere and in all ages. Douglas established the North Star newspaper, later called Frederick Douglass's paper, using funds he earned on his speaking tour here. The name of the newspaper referenced the legend that escaping slaves used the North Star in the night sky to guide them to freedom. It was published in Rochester, New York, a city known for its opposition to slavery, and its slogan was, write as if no sex, 
truth is of no color. God is the father of us all, and we are all brethren. Right is of no sex. Truth is of no color. God is the father of us all, and we are all brethren. As you know, Douglas had deep personal and ideological ties to William Lord Garrison. However, by the 1850s, historians argue that Douglas had changed course from Garrison's brand of abolitionism that was centered upon moral suasion, refusal to vote, and disunionism, and he had switched to a more political abolitionism. Historian William McFeely makes the case that in the years between the founding of the North Star and the outbreak of the American Civil War in 1861, Douglass's work defined him as an increasingly public and therefore political man. And during this period, free African Americans were political in the same way that women were in the public sphere, making speeches and printing pamphlets. In Douglass's case, he published his second autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, in 1855. He continued to publish his newspaper as a weekly in which he advocated black self-help, racial pride, and access to economic opportunity. He traveled and spoke on those issues across the Northern states. And over the years, he harbored over 100 fugitive slaves in his house in Rochester, New York. But ultimately, Douglas came to believe that the only way that African-American freedom and equality could become possible was through national conflict and direct federal action. From the beginning of the American Civil War in 1861, Douglas campaigned for the inclusion of black soldiers in the Union Army, which he felt would help them secure citizenship rights. He met with political leaders, including President Abraham Lincoln. He corresponded with influential friends on the subject and published editorials about this subject in his paper as well. Douglas and President Lincoln forged a friendship of sorts during the Civil War, although Douglas often found fault with him. Many historians argue that it was Douglas's influence, among other factors, that helped move Lincoln towards his decision to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. January the 1st, 1863, President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which in addition to freeing between three and four million slaves, decreed that such persons, that is African-American men, of suitable condition will be received into the armed services of the United States. Soon, President Lincoln gave orders to the abolitionist governor of Massachusetts, John Andrew, to raise soldiers for the 54th and 55th Colored Massachusetts Regiment. Douglas's sons, Charles and Lewis, were among the first African-American recruits to join the 54th Massachusetts Infantry. And this slide is the statue on Boston Common in tribute uh, to the Massachusetts 54th. It's beautiful. Great to see in person. As you would expect, Frederick Douglass was actively involved in the recruitment of African-American soldiers to the Union Army. He traveled all over the Northern US to attend recruitment meetings, and of course he lobbied for recruitment in his newspaper. In your document booklets, I've included one of his recruiting speeches that formed the basis of his broadside that's on this slide. If you look closely, hopefully you can see his name listed there. It's the third name down on the way to the furthest column on the left. Douglas did ultimately criticize Lincoln over the treatment of African-American soldiers in the Union Army, but he did believe in the power of service to the country and creating opportunities for social and political equality. Douglas said, once let a black man get upon his person the brass letters US, and there was no power on earth which can deny that he's earned the right to citizenship in the United States. That was an equation taken up by civil rights activists in the 20th century as they fought to have African-Americans serve in the military in a meaningful way during the two world wars, the Korean War and the Vietnam War. In conclusion, Douglas's trip to Ireland was instrumental in his personal and professional development through the influence of Daniel O'Connell's worldview, witnessing the aspects of human misery that existed outside of slavery, and the, and the autonomy that he experienced here, both in presenting his ideas in public and in presenting his narrative. Glasgow-based poet Tawan S. Atwali, who has been inspired, inspired by Douglas, said, Frederick Douglass had a vision, and it's difficult carrying a vision because not everyone around you can see it. The abolition of slavery, civic inclusion for African Americans, the extension of women's rights and human rights, along with the understanding that his words carried weight and could affect change were all part of Douglass's life 
and work and his vision. And I believe the foundation of that vision was laid here in Ireland. Thank you.